So uh, appreciate the uh, invitation to present today. My name is Michael Brown. I work with WSP uh, in our national complex bridge group. Uh, I want to talk to you. I was going to talk about an array of projects, but then uh, as I got to putting this together, I wanted to talk really about one project that is sort of a good example overall. Um, so talk about evaluation and monitoring of segmental concrete bridges. Here we go. So what I'm going to talk about today is the West Seattle High Rise Bridge. Uh, many of you may have heard of this bridge. It's been in the, the news quite a bit lately. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the current situation with that bridge and some of the things that we've been doing to evaluate and monitor it. Um, so the bridge is a multi-span uh, bridge. The, the approaches are uh, pre-stress multi-girder uh, deck approaches. And then the main span unit is a three span, uh, it's actually twin cast in place post-tension segmental box girders. Uh, it was constructed with balanced cantilever construction back in the 1980 era, uh, put into service in 84. Uh, just a quick elevation and sectional view to get an idea of the structure. So the main span is about 590 feet. Uh, and then uh, the, each of the two flanking spans that work with that to make up the main span unit are 375 feet. Uh, the bottom section shows that the uh, the main box actually is is tapered. So at the uh, ends near the pier tables, uh, the height is as much as 30 feet, whereas near the mid span is much shallower at uh, at 12 feet and a typical trapezoidal uh, box configuration. Uh, the issue that that has brought attention to this bridge uh, has to do with the development of cracking that's occurred in the main span uh, primarily uh, boxes. Uh, and it's been fairly uniformly observed uh, in both of the boxes at both ends of the, the main span, if you will. Uh, so four, four essentially mirror image locations. Uh, the cracking was first observed in the 1998 timeframe. Uh, it's just very minor hairline cracks, but occurring in the webs and, the, and in the soffit of, or, or the bottom flange of the box. Uh, that was continued to be monitored. And by 2009, we were seeing reports of more significant longitudinal and diagonal cracks in the bottom of the box, as well as horizontal and diagonal cracks in the webs and actual uh, cracking or, or opening at joint segments. Uh, and so uh, starting in the uh, 2000 teens, I guess you might say, around 2013, uh, some instrumentation was actually installed on the cracks in the soffit, the, the uh, bottom web of the box uh, to monitor over time. And uh, then just last summer, there was an effort to inject any cracks that were greater than 0.2 millimeters in width. And that was, that was undertaken. That's partly why the cracking is so visible in the upper right, the epoxy that was placed over the cracks before they were injected. Um, so that sort of emphasizes the pattern of the crack, but it makes it very visible. Um, so uh, after the injection, uh, inspections continued uh, to monitor the cracks and, and there was a noticeable increase in crack growth during the winter uh, night of 2019, 2020. And so that raised some concerns. And in March, uh, Seattle DOT found it necessary to close the bridge to traffic. Uh, the bottom figure just shows the general region where this cracking has occurred. So it's sort of the point of counterflexure uh, within the main span. Uh, so a couple of uh, different causes have been attributed to the development of this cracking. The, the first and foremost is that we believe that the creep behavior of the concrete has continued long term uh, in a way that would not have been predicted by the state of the knowledge, state of the practice in 1980. Um, the creep has continued and so you've been getting this continued uh, shrinkage of the structure and, and, res and uh, restraint 
Uh, adding to that or exacerbating the issue was the configuration of the post tensioning in the bottom flange of the main span, uh, which you can see a plan view in the bottom left here actually shows uh, where those tendons end in essentially two planes of anchorage uh, at, at uh, segments, what are labeled as segments 38 and segment 40. And so <clears throat> uh, to the right is just a show of how that anchorage uh, configuration is in, in section. Of, uh, the blister comes up from the flange and sticks up and then a, an end view of that, that buttress where it's anchored just to get an idea. So a lot of the cracks actually are, are emanating in the area around these anchorage points. So there's a change in, in stress condition at that location that has uh, contributed in addition to the uh, believed uh, long-term creep to contribute to growth of these cracks. And so as I said, over the winter, there was a continual monitoring program of these cracks and over the period of just a couple of months, we saw cumulative growth of these cracks uh, in several feet each. And so that uh, raised a bit of alarm as to whether or not there was a potential uh, developing threat to uh, stability, potential uh, towards hinge formation and that sort of thing. So uh, to be able to better understand what's going on and, and uh, come up with a way to address it. Uh, the bridge was closed and emergency evaluation was implemented. Also contributing to the development of cracking is believed to be a condition at the end of the box. Uh, in the upper right corner here, you can see that uh, at, at one of the piers, uh, piers 15 and 18 are the piers where you transition from the main span unit to the approaches. And so you would have a transition from the segmental box to the girder deck configuration. The girder deck, uh, the girders for the, the approaches are actually embedded in a diaphragm that has a shear key that holds that in place. And then the, uh, the box is a butt uh, to that supported on the pier. And um, in that configuration, the two boxes actually are held laterally um, by uh, some slide plates so there's sort of a shear key arrangement within the pier that keeps the boxes from moving uh, sideways. Uh, it's believed that uh, there may be some restraint condition where these are not sliding freely the way they should be, uh, partly due to uh, some, some lateral moving or twisting of the superstructure that may be causing uh, it to lock up. And so uh, that's one of the contributing factors, this restraint condition. Uh, to the development of the cracking. And indeed, even back in the, the, the late 90s, some of the early reports actually showed development of some cracking uh, in this pier uh, cap where this uh, detail comes together that's showing some tension. Um, so the manifestation of that uh, in the cumulative uh, creep behavior is a uh, series of diagonal and horizontal cracks in the webs. And uh, one area that was of particular concern was the development of horizontal cracks at the top of the web where it meets the bottom of the, uh, the deck, which is of course the, the top flange of the box. Um, and that seems to be reasonably extensive, the, the length of cracking along that interface. So that raised a question as to whether or not um, there's another condition that's contributing to the formation of uh, the cracking at that top of web interface. To investigate it, uh, we used a, an array of uh, visual and probing and non-destructive evaluation techniques, the, the primary of which was ultrasonic pulse velocity. Uh, where the transducers were arranged, as shown in the upper right corner, in a pitch and catch arrangement with the idea that uh, if a crack emanates into uh, this interface, then the time of flight would be affected. And if the crack were to actually penetrate full width, then there would actually be a break in the path for the stress wave and you may not receive a solid signal at all. And so this was a, a method to determine 
the, uh, the depth and extent of cracks. So these would be done by deploying the transducers in locations above and below this area of chamfer between the deck and the web. And, and then the time of flight measurements made. And so as a result, as you're working along the length of a horizontal crack, we would then map the, the perceived crack depth based on the calculations from the UPV measurements. Uh, so the deeper the crack meant that the, the wave had to travel further. And so then we did some statistical distributions on that and also some ground truthing. So for example, in a horizontal crack where we had a sub significant depth indicated, we drilled in that location to try to trace uh, the depth of the crack. Uh, to complement that testing, we also used a technique called ultrasonic shear wave tomography, uh, which uses an array of uh, dry point contact uh, shear wave transducers that fire in sequence and then are received by the complementary uh, transducers in the array to essentially reconstruct a three-dimensional de uh, depiction of what is uh, present in the way of boundary conditions within the concrete below the array. And so in, in the uh, figure to the left, this is showing how the array was deployed along a grid on the deck directly above the web of the box. And then the interpretation of that uh, information, uh, it gives a three-dimensional uh, representation, but then you can filter that. And so this is a plan view of the filtered data looking at just a, a specific depth range uh, from the top surface of the deck that would correlate with the top of web interface. And, and then the uh, black lines here actually show the uh, outline or the uh, boundaries of the web framing in below. And so then this cutout below shows where uh, indications uh, actually permeate into the area that would be the web whereas these large red areas would actually be uh, believed to be the soffit, uh, you know, the overhang of the box. So we were able to then use this information to correlate with the UPV information shown previously to show uh, consistency in where we believe cracks are permeating. The good news was that these cracks did not appear to go full uh, width. Uh, and so most of them had a very limited depth range uh, from, the, from the interior surface of the web. Uh, another question related to the development of both the horizontal and the diagonal cracking was whether or not there was some reason that the vertical post tensioning in the webs was not effective. And so we wanted to investigate the integrity of vertical tendons uh, in the box. To do so, um, we were looking for voids in the grout or voids around the ducts that might be interfering with the uh, structural behavior of the vertical tendons. We used a combination of impact echo, uh, ultrasonic, or ultrasonic shear wave tomography, some ground truthing uh, for verification, and then sampling of the, the grout within the ducts to better understand the integrity of the tendons. So for example, on the left here uh, are some impact echo responses. We use ground penetrating radar to locate the exact profile of the tendon and then used impact of echo directly over the tendon to look at uh, the wave response. And so for an intact tendon with good grout, the wave will pass pretty much continuously through the tendon into the back wall and you get a nice clean reflection. Um, in the case where there is a void in the tendon, then that has uh, a, an effect that causes the wave to actually either uh, refract or have to travel around the duct to get to the back wall and return. So you, you see a, a variation in the, the response time uh, as a function of the depth of the tendon. One thing I'll note just briefly uh, from the previous slide, you see how this tapers off to the side that's a function of this detail where uh, in part of the wall, there's a constant cover depth to the tendon, but there's a point where there's a, uh, an angle in the formwork so that the distance between the concrete surface and the tendon increases. And of course, the distance between this surface and the back, 
back wall increases. So that's why you see an actual change in slope here. And so similarly with the ultrasonic shear wave tomography, uh, we looked for essentially uh, the three dimensional response where we could identify the tendon and we could identify the back wall. If, if things were in good condition, then we got fairly clean responses from those. Uh, in, in cases where there were voids, we would get a very large reflection at the surface of the tendon uh, because that became now a boundary condition that was changing the signal. And so uh, to ground truth, what we were seeing then, we went and selectively drilled in, a, in locations. So in most locations, we opened the duct, which were galvanized steel, and found intact uh, grout. Uh, in one tendon in the vertical webs, we did find uh, a tendon that had not been properly grouted. There's not really evidence that grout was ever really in this space. Uh, so during construction in this one location, it appears that it, it was either skipped or there was a blockage so that the grouting operation was not successful. This was the exception. Um, by far, most of the conditions were like this. And in revealing the tendons, uh, we found that the strands were in very good condition with only extremely superficial uh, surface corrosion that was likely uh, there, you know, from just simple construction and, and yard storage, not, not anything that appears to have evolved in service. Oops, sorry. So in addition to the condition evaluation, um, we also have installed structural monitoring to better understand the contributing factors to the, the cracking that we're seeing and, and to some degree to monitor global uh, stability. And so those have included uh, a MEMS shape array system that is arrayed longitudinally along the decks to look at uh, long-term uh, vertical displacement rotation of the, uh, of the girder. In addition, we've installed vibrating wire sensors as crack gauges in select locations to monitor the opening and closing or slip behavior uh, you know, transverse to cracks. And then finally, uh, with regard to the end displacements, we've also put string potentiometers to monitor both uh, longitudinal and transverse movement of the uh, superstructure elements relative to the pier. And so, for example, uh, in each of the, the quadrants of the bridge where this uh, cracking uh, was forming near the anchorage blisters, you would see these diagonal crack formations. So we would gauge individual cracks across the crack as well as uh, groups of cracks with an extended gauge to get cumulative behavior. And then what we call slip gauges that were oriented transverse to the crack to see whether the, each side of the crack, if there was any movement, you uh, know, sort of a shear uh, behavior across that crack. Uh, in addition, there's some cameras that, that are monitoring and could potentially be used for digital image correlation. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, at the ends of, this, of the main unit, there are potentiometers that are measuring longitudinal and transverse uh, movement of the superstructure. Uh, both on the uh, main unit side and the approaches. So of course we've been monitoring for about six months now um, and, and trying to carefully watch for crack growth behavior. Um, most of the information has been, uh, most of what we've seen has actually been directly correlated to temperature which is shown in gray here. Um, so for example the long gauges over groups of cracks in the uh, floor of the, the beam. Um, while they show the diurnal temperature cycles, uh, we're not seeing long-term trends that differ from simply the, uh, the influence of temperature. Same thing with, uh, for example, the slip gauges. Um, we did want to try to evaluate to see if there's continued crack growth and to try to remove the influence of temperature. So an analysis of, uh, for example, a slip gauge here showed the range of behavior as a function of temperature of the gauges. Uh, and we were able to come up with a, a mathematical function to essentially correct, if you will, 
for temperature influence. And, and we're using that to uh, modify uh, some predetermined alert levels that we have so that if we get more than a certain amount of movement, uh, we will be alerted so that uh, if something's happening that we don't expect, uh, we'll know right away. Um, as far as overall behavior, the crack growth, um, we've looked at that in two ways. One, we've continued to physically measure and monitor cracking over time. Um, and since the spring, it was uh, pretty steep in the spring, but then over the summer, it's tapered off. And then using the temperature corrected uh, crack uh, monitoring, we see a similar situation where during the spring, there was steady growth. There was a sudden jump here in the gauges. This actually has to do with the contractor lifting some uh, platforms in place. So there was a more or less an elastic displacement related to uh, a new load on the structure. Uh, but overall, the behavior has somewhat leveled off uh, since that point. So that's the good news is the crack growth seems to be uh, under control. So that's, uh, that's my story. It's still ongoing, um, but I wanted to share with you. I thought you might find it interesting. So. <laughs>